You're listening to the Shoeless Podcast, where we talk candidly about married life and parenting within the domestic church in the light of Carmelite spirituality and the Catholic faith. We're your hosts, Donald and Megan Wallenfang, and we invite you into today's conversation of living Catholic with abandon. Welcome everyone to this episode of the Shoeless Podcast. We are so excited to discuss the meaning of living shoeless in a disquieted world. It is one that resonates deep within us and within our children. So today we will be asking, why shoeless? Why would someone choose to go about life shoeless? And what does shoeless have to do with the Catholic Christian faith? I think of eight people in our family who love to go about life shoeless simply because of the way that it feels. And six of those people that I'm thinking of are our children who, since the beginning of their time outside the womb, have loved to kick off their socks. Or if you try to put shoes on, they're not interested in that either. They take those right off. Inside or outside, shoeless for them is the preferred way to be. I can remember so many times in the grocery store or out shopping with our kids when they were little and someone would comment, where are your kids' shoes? And I would have to just shrug my shoulders and say, they don't like to wear them. It's so beautiful to see the child who lives in this way without shoes. What is it about bare feet that they love so much? In the summer, often our kids are outside walking around barefoot, and I can't help but think that they love the way it feels, the grass, And then even in the winter, sometimes our children are barefoot. Just last week, when it snowed, two of our youngest children ran outside in the snow in their bare feet. And it may seem crazy to some people, but to children, it's all about feeling the realities of the elements. And they do not shy away from getting to know its extremes. So Megan, what do you enjoy personally about going about the day without shoes is there something about that experience that you lean into because i notice oftentimes you're going about the house with no shoes Mm -hmm. no socks Mm -hmm. and it seems like you have a proclivity for going about barefoot yeah i think physically speaking being barefoot being without shoes helps you feel grounded We literally feel the ground. And there's a certain stability that comes from being in direct contact with the ground. And it also can mean that we feel different terrains. So we're able to use this sense of touch to feel different places where we're standing or where we're walking. Throughout the year and as we live, we might feel the warm sand or the hot pavement or sharp stones or slippery mossy rocks or the wet ocean and i think it's so healthy for us to feel the natural elements and also i think it's a beautiful metaphor for feeling the different terrains of our lives and i think the soul yearns to live into the ups and downs the different terrains of life um, with all of its joys and sorrows Yeah, there's something special about not wearing shoes. Both of us grew up on the shores of Lake Michigan. Mm -hmm. You in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, the Bay, Gladstone Mm -hmm. Bay, Mm -hmm. and me in Southwest Michigan, St. Joseph Benton Harbor. Mm -hmm. And it's just so wonderful to go down to the beach, not have shoes on. And like you're saying, you feel everything. You feel the heat of the sand, Mm -hmm. the softness of the sand, Mm -hmm. and then your feet going into the the chill of the water. Mm -hmm. And everything that the feet sense just shoots right up to the Mm -hmm. rest of the body. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting that the feet can serve as a kind of antenna or something for the whole body. Mm. It's a way that we explore our immediate local environment Mm -hmm. with the feet, just like we do with our hands. But it seems even with the feet, there's something even more sensitive, Mm -hmm. even more vulnerable. Yeah, The feet just really are 
reacting to that environment very quickly. Mm -hmm. In our book, Shoeless, this is part of the conversation of the introduction. And I know there's a great story that you love, Donnie. So what is that about? When I hear the word shoeless, I think of the athlete, very well known, Shoeless Joe Jackson, the baseball player. And I love this story about where he got this nickname. It's very interesting. We might wonder where did he get this nickname? Shoeless Joe. So he was playing for the Greenville Spinners. It was his first year in the minor leagues playing baseball at the tender age of 19. And in this first season, he began to develop blisters on his feet from his new baseball shoes. And if you've ever had this experience, when you're wearing new shoes, maybe you go run in them. Or I know it's happened with me playing football, put on new football cleats mm-hmm. and you're practicing two-a-day practices all week and you start to get blisters yeah. inevitably. Mm-hmm. It's, it's quite, hard to break in new shoes. Yeah, mm-hmm. quite painful. So appropriately... Joe Jackson was confined to the dugout to heal, but game day came and his team was short of players. His coach called upon him to bat, and instead of wearing his new cleats, he stepped up to home plate in his bare stockings. It was the seventh inning. He proceeded to hit a triple, and when sliding into third base, a fan called out from the stands nearby, "'You shoeless son of a gun, you!' From that day on, he was nicknamed Shoeless Joe Jackson. So I think there's a lot of connections between the story of Shoeless Joe Jackson Mm -hmm. and the spiritual life, our route toward intimacy with God. And we must suffer humiliation. And it was probably quite humiliating for him to go up to bat with (laughs) no cleats Mm -hmm. on, Mm -hmm. just bare stockings. But then he did something wonderful with it. And this is what God's grace empowers us to do. Something wonderful. Through this exposure, this nakedness, this vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So the symbolism of going about shoeless expresses the willingness for God to act, for God to lead, and to trust God with this process of humility. Mm -hmm. Right. And poverty as well. I mean, we think of in the United States, this saying that's on a lot of door fronts of stores, no shoes, no shirt, no service. So if you don't have a pair of shoes to wear, or you don't have a shirt, this might mean that you don't have the resources to purchase some shoes or a shirt. It really is a discrimination against serving people who are living in poverty, who are not able to walk in a store with shoes. This idea of not having shoes is a very impoverished idea because naturally most of us would want to have shoes on, but having no shoes leaves you in a place of poverty and of great humility. Most definitely, and it's a very rich biblical image. There's so many passages in scripture where we read about the main characters not wearing shoes or washing another person's feet Mm -hmm. who does not have shoes on. Mm -hmm. There's great spiritual meaning with naked feet in this experience. For example, we observe the scene with Abraham's invitation to his three divine passers-by. And then again with Lot as host to two angelic personas, with Rebecca's welcome of Abraham's servant, with Joseph's hospitality toward his brothers, and above all with Jesus and his stupefied disciples. All these scenes of feet washing. And even uh, with surprise, the humble wife-to-be of King David, named Abigail, whose name means my father's joy, where my father is joy, a self-identified maid servant who vows to be the slave who washes the feet of my Lord's servants. And remember how Jesus solemnly declared to Peter, unless I wash you, you will have no inheritance with me. So to shed one's shoes implies the ultimate degree of spiritual humility and submission to the divine will. It signifies proximity closeness, nearness to the holy. We recall Moses' encounter with the mysterious inbreaking of divine presence in the phenomenon of a bush engulfed in flames 
yet not consumed, as God said to Moses. Do not come near. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Mm -hmm. I like you were referring to when Jesus washed the disciples' feet and this very intimate opportunity for service in contrast to this thing that we have in the United States of no shoes, no shirt, no service. Jesus says, no shoes, no shirt, I will serve you. Mm. And so Jesus comes to serve those who are living in poverty, who are broken, who are humble, who are the lowest. That's so good. It's so true. Being without shoes seems to go hand in hand with living in material poverty. And we would connect this too to living in spiritual poverty. What does it mean to be discalced? in terms of physical footwear, but also what does it mean to be discalced in terms of the heart? Mm -hmm. A heart that sheds its callousness. Mm. So discalced, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, it means precisely without shoes, without a kind of calcified surrounding of the naked foot. Mm -hmm. Uh, No shoes, no footwear. The Reformed Order of Carmelites of St. Teresa of Avila that she began in the 16th century in her new constitutions for this Reformed Order, they were to be called the Order of Discalced Carmelites. A more uh, intensified living out of this Carmelite charism Mm -hmm. and apostate of contemplation. And she instructed the new Carmelite nuns and friars, brothers, not to wear shoes in the monastery. Mm -hmm. And this original rule was mitigated for different practical reasons, but in the monastery, the idea was don't wear shoes day and night. So to remember their poverty. Yes. To remember their physical and spiritual poverty. Yes, both Mm -hmm. things together. Yeah, discalced. It's such a beautiful term, and it also signifies to me laying down our arms Mm -hmm. laying down our resistance to the will of God, to the call of the other who faces me, laying down all resistance, arms, shields, insulation, barriers, walls, Mm -hmm. lay it all down, Mm -hmm. become discalced, become vulnerable, Mm -hmm. surrender to the vulnerability of the other person, Mm -hmm. their call, become responsible for the other To love involves this divestment, Mm -hmm. this process of becoming discalced vis-a-vis the divine other and the human other, the uncanny otherness of vulnerability itself. Even that word vulnerability comes from a Latin root, vulnere, which means to wound. When we walk with discalced or shoeless feet, they are more vulnerable, they are more woundable. But again, this is a great symbol for our whole body, our whole personhood in relation to the divine other and the human other who faces me and calls to me to be responsible for him or her. Mm -hmm. This is making me think about what it is like to really live this out in family life, especially. You were mentioning um, when you were talking about exposure, and it reminds me of when each of our children were born, and they come out and they're completely naked and obviously shoeless. And one of the things that they do right away shortly after birth is to get their footprints and these are a treasure that we have that we keep of our baby's footprints it is a reminder of how unique they are and unrepeatable that no two people have these same footprints toe prints they look so unique to each person also not only is these footprints but the shape of their foot or even other markings on their feet birthmarks or other colors that make these feet so special also as a mother i noticed that it's a reflection of their unique personality that god has given them and even beyond that but their unique cosmic task in the world and that each one of us that has been created by god has been given a unique set of feet to to live out our cosmic task, to live the mission that Christ has given us to carry the good news, 
to whoever it is that we meet, whoever it is that is, as you were saying, this other that we encounter, whether the other who faces us is within our family or without, outside of our family, that we carry this good news on these feet that were given in a particular way that was asked of only us. There's a perfect scripture passage to go right along with what you're saying, Megan, from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 52. And before I read it, I just have to tell a short story of one of my first real encounters with this Bible verse, Isaiah 52, verse 7. When I was writing my master's thesis at St. Norbert College in Northeast Wisconsin, I chose the topic, or maybe it chose me, it's better to say, What exactly is the good news of Jesus when we say the gospel of Jesus Christ is such good news? What is it in a nutshell to sum it up? And I was familiar with this verse that talked about this good news and the one who brings the good news. And I was so excited about it, I had to read it in the original Hebrew. So I ordered the original critical edition of the Hebrew scriptures from Amazon and it was delivered to our house. And I opened the package and I went right for this passage. I had to see it in Hebrew. And the pages were missing. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) The pages of Isaiah chapter 52 and surrounding chapters were missing in my critical edition. So it ended up being an uncritical edition for that reason. (laughs) And I had to return it to Amazon and get uh, a different replacement one, which did include all the pages. And I loved to read this in Hebrew, but the verse in English translation is this. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the one bringing good news, announcing peace, bearing good news, announcing salvation, saying to Zion, your God is king. So when you're talking about the beautiful feet of the infant who comes into view after birth, and we get the footprints of the infant. And the infant, we read elsewhere in scripture in the book of Psalms, on the mouths of infants and babes, Mm -hmm. the Lord has found praise to Mm -hmm. fool the enemy. Mm -hmm. And this is so true that the genius of the child in him or herself is good news. The infant Mm -hmm. testifies to the good news of the infant Christ. Mm. The religious potential of the child is there even in the infant. The very Mm -hmm. early nascent stages of development and very early childhood, uh, the stages of being an infant, a toddler, through all the planes of development. Mm -hmm. In this verse, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the one bringing good news. The beauty of the feet And we think of the discalced feet, especially. We think about the infant Jesus with his discalced feet. Mm. The toddler Jesus with his discalced feet. The young child, eventually the adolescent. And then the fully grown man Jesus with his discalced feet. His feet that walk on water. His feet that tread on the serpent and his feet that he gives over to walk the way of the cross and then to be nailed to the cross Mm. for our salvation. And these feet are beautiful because from them salvation flows. The saving blood of Christ flows from his hands and his feet. And feet are special because, as you said earlier, they ground us. They're the part of the body that makes contact with the earth and reminds us of our origin Mm -hmm. and our destiny in as much as we will be born again from the womb of the earth upon the resurrection Mm -hmm. of our bodies. These beautiful feet that testify to an eternal rendezvous of redemption. Mm -hmm. And this is the good news. And the one who shares this news announces the shalom of God, bears the good news in their body, in their words, announcing Yeshua. This is the very name of Jesus in Hebrew. We say salvation or the Lord's salvation. Saying to Zion, your God is king. I am not king of the universe. No other human being or emperor or president is king of the universe. The Lord God is the rightful king of the universe. 
Jesus Christ is the king of the universe because he is God in the flesh. And he wears a crown of thorns and his throne is the cross of wood. And his royal garments are stark nakedness, including his discalced feet. These biblical passages are such a great reminder of our Carmelite soul that is discalced before God and is bare, vulnerable, humble, in poverty, and in need of a Savior, Mm -hmm. in need of the love and mercy of a Savior. And practically speaking, we know that we cannot always walk around without shoes. It is required of us where we live to often have shoes on. But perhaps we could try to be shoeless a little more often as a means of prayer, not only for during our times of prayer, intimate prayer with God for ourselves, but also in relationship to our service, to our family, to be barefoot and to help us serve our family more, to recognize the needs of others. This has been a great conversation to think more about our feet and where they have gone and where they're being asked to go and to say yes to where they're being asked to go in our own homes and outside of our homes. So let's close in prayer. A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 10. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone to preach? And how can people preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Thank you, Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for this blessed time to seek your face, to call upon your name, and to ponder what it means to live shoeless. Shoeless feet and shoeless hearts before you, before your majesty. May you continue to teach us what it means to live shoeless after your own discalced feet, going the way of the cross all the way to Golgotha, the place of the skull, to give your feet up to the point of abandonment to do your Father's will out of love for us, your beloved children. We praise your name, O Lord, as we say glory be to the the Father Father, and to to the the Son and to to the the Holy Spirit. Spirit. As As it it was was in the beginning, beginning, is now, now, and and ever shall be, world without end. end. Amen. All the Carmelite saints, pray pray for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us on the Shoeless Podcast. We hope you continue the conversation in your own home and with the people you love. We hope it challenges and inspires you to walk shoeless in the world and to live Catholic with abandon. 